Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a very special guest. It's everybody's progressive champion. It's uh, he's He was the mayor of Cleveland. He's been a member of Congress. He ran for president in 2004, 2008, and now he's running for governor of Ohio. Please welcome the almighty Dennis Kucinich. Hello, Mr. Kucinich. Thanks for being our guest. Just a humble servant of the people. There's nothing almighty about me. <laughs> I'm, happy, I'm happy to be here. Well, listen, we've noticed, uh, first of all, uh, everybody who watches this show, I'm sure, is aware of the good work that you've done. That, uh, in fact, the Washington Post just did a story a week or two ago about how uh, the Democratic Party has finally caught up to your positions, which is nice to see. Right. So you're a leader. You're always out in front on the issues. And then the rest of the party has to catch up to you. And now they're catching up to you. So tell me, tell everybody why you're running for governor. Well, I'm, I'm running for governor to be able to bring health care for all to Ohio. Uh, I'll soon be releasing details of a Ohio care plan that would eliminate premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and bring uh, health care within a reach of every Ohioan. Uh, right now, there are so many families who are suffering from the very high cost of health care. And when there's a major illness in a family, it can wipe people out financially. So we want to take that burden away from people and create a plan in Ohio where Ohio would lead the way for the rest of the country. Wow. So that's what it must be, because the smears have already started on you. And I caught this last week at the Huffington Post, and I'm going to put it up uh, so everybody could see. I don't know if you can see it, but it was the Huffington Post and the headline was the fall of Kucinich, new ties to butcher Bashar. Um <laughs> That was made me laugh when I saw it, uh, not only because I was recently a, sm a victim of a smear by CNN for being anti-war, but everyone knows that of all the people in politics, you're probably the most uh, uh, strident for peace and anti-war, right? So that's why that's kind of funny. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, Go ahead. I mean, let me just tell you something. Uh, in the Democratic Party, there's a pro-war faction. Uh, they were for going to war against Iraq, even though the facts indicated otherwise. They were for going to war uh, against F uh, against Libya. They were for staying in Afghanistan at war. They were for sending troops to Syria. Uh, America has over 800 bases in about 130 countries. You couldn't have that without the complicity of both political parties. And so the Democrats who are the ones who are attacking me on this are, you know, they're, they're bought off by, uh, by certain interests that just want to keep war going. And that's too bad, but you know what? It doesn't phase me. I, I've seen this kind of stuff before. And anytime you stand up for peace, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and so, uh, you, you have to be ready to take some knocks, but you know what, what I found is that war is not necessary. War is a racket. And we need to challenge the thinking that takes us to war, because that's the thinking that can destroy our country. And I look at the world as an undivided whole. I see, I see us as all, of, all people as being interconnected and interdependent. And I think human unity is the basic truth that we have of our existence. And so I act upon that. I look to talk to people to try to find ways of reconciling differences to try to end conflict uh, instead of accelerating it. And so, you know, I've done that all over the world. And of course, you know, there are people who don't like it. Uh, we know uh, very well that lesson. We've learned that lesson here that when you do stick your neck out for peace, you're going to get a big backlash and you're going to get a lot of smears. And what we've also experienced, and it was revealed in the 2016 election, is that once a corporate Democrat or someone in the corporate press wants to debate you, they don't debate progressives. They first smear you. And then maybe they'll talk about your ideas. So that that's well, I, I, go ahead. Again, I appreciate I appreciate your recognition of that because uh, you know no one likes to be smeared. But I can assure you that none of that has any impact in slowing down my efforts to try to end conflict abroad or to try to end the wars here at home, which are brought about by. These assault weapons, which are so freely available in our country, five states have now banned them. I want Ohio to be the sixth. And this button that I'm wearing, Jimmy, 
This uh, is my NRA rating. It's an F rating. I, oh, I don't know if you can see. okay. That's what I thought that is. That, okay. Yeah, through 16 years in Congress, I've earned an F from the NRA. I'm proud of that. And, of course, uh, my principal opponent in this race has an A from the NRA, uh, which is a pretty uh, a fancy footwork for a Democrat. No kidding. Cordray has a A rating from the NRA. Well, he's, he's earned it, actually. You know, he, he led the effort in knocking out Cleveland's uh, assault weapons ban in 2010 uh, as attorney general. Uh, and then he went to the U.S. Supreme Court to knock out the city of Chicago's gun law, which affected every city, uh, every city in the country. Oh. Uh, and he's held rallies on a state house lawn with uh, people who are carrying assault weapons. And he's talked about uh, these weapons in, an almost, in almost religious terms as being a, a natural right, a God given right. Uh, part of the Anglo-American tradition. I mean, come on, you know, it, 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 it's hard to take that seriously, except that he is being supported by the Democratic establishment in this state, which don't really don't care about the issues. They don't care about people. They just care about holding control. So let me ask you about that. So you're running as a Democrat. Tim Canova recently realized that that was a dead end for him in Florida, and he's running as an independent because lots of uh, millennials and progressives left the party because the DNC cheated them out of uh, Bernie Sanders. And it was manifest. That's not up for debate. Donna Brazile wrote a book about it. So. Why do you still think that uh, you, it's necessary for you to run inside the Democratic Party when the people inside the Democratic Party are not only working against you, but working against their base, which are progressives? No, that's true. You're absolutely right. And the question you asked is a valid one. I happen to think that I can win this. And I happen to think in doing so, I can transform the Democratic Party and transform the politics of the state of Ohio. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, no longer, you know, the party establishment doesn't represent the people. They they side with the insurance companies on health care. They side with uh, the uh, gas and oil interests on fracking. They side with the NRA on assault weapons. They side with banks and, and utilities and all those interests which are uh, adverse to the economic interests of the people of Ohio. So my election in a Democratic primary would be the first, one of the first steps that's happened nationally to push things in the other direction. And it's possible. I mean, the last poll that was taken uh, showed that I'm in a dead heat. So I think it's, you know, we really have a good chance to win. Wow. Well, that's very encouraging. Uh, that really is very encouraging. So I've been just, uh, uh, you know, very down on the Democratic Party, uh, not progressives. I'm for progressives no matter where they are, even if they're a Republican. If you're a progressive, I'll be for you. Right now, we keep seeing Democrats joining the Republicans to do horrible things like they just gutted the uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, which was the regulations put in after the economic crash that was brought on by the deregulation from Bill Clinton. So uh, wh how do we so you think that you being winning this primary, you think that would send a shockwave through the Democratic Party, or do you think that they would just double down on their efforts to kind of discredit you? Well, let me just say that if the people in Ohio decide to choose me as their nominee, uh, that will have a profound impact on the uh, political structure of the state with respect to the Democratic Party. At this point, the state uh, Democratic Party establishment is essentially a dead brokerage. Uh, they've assumed the control and the brand of the Democratic of Democrats, but they don't have uh, influence except, you know, the brand does have some sway. So, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not unaware of what it's like to have whatever apparatus is out there be, you know, focused on my campaign trying to destroy it. But I'm also confident that in this election, the people of Ohio <laughs> Uh, may very well, you know, will respond to our message, which is jobs for all, health care for all, education for all, clean air, clean water, and get rid of assault weapons. And that's just for openers. Now, I'm going to guess that most of those positions that you, you advocated are popular with the majority of Ohioans, correct? I've been getting a pretty good response. You know, it's, there's a, uh, a misperception about Southern Ohio, which says that, well, these are people that really love their guns and 
and particularly assault weapons. And wherever I speak, in one end of the state or the other, there seems to be a very strong support for banning assault weapons. And that's a big deal. And so the, the idea of uh, the stereotyping of certain regions in Ohio is really false. I, again, because I look at the world as an integrated all, that's how I view the state of Ohio. And I see the common concerns that people have, you know, one of which certainly is is uh, health care for all, because the cost of health care is going through the roof. And the insurance companies who famously make money not providing health care are doing everything they can to you know, make insurance not available in certain areas, denying people uh, uh, reimbursement for emergency room visits, increasing premiums, co-pays and deductibles. The system is, is broken. And I think that based on my experience in drafting H.R. 676 in Congress, the Universal Single Payer Not-for-Profit Health Care Bill, H.R. 676, I can bring that same uh, letter and spirit to Ohio and give Ohioans a, cha- a chance for real health care. Now, I tell the story uh, on this show about the Affordable Care Act that Barack Obama passed, the Obamacare. When he was when they were passing that, uh, you were holding out for a public option. I was. And uh, they could have passed that public option. They said, well, we can't get it past 60 votes. But then they ended up passing Obamacare on 50 votes. So they could have inserted the public option into that bill Barack Obama chose not to. Now, can you tell us why you think that happened and why did he come to your district to uh, campaign against you instead of going to Ben Nelson's state and campaigning against him? Well, let me say that um, um, I had five meetings with the president on the health care bill. Three of them were in, you know, were attended by maybe two dozen members of Congress. And uh, one of them, there were three members of Congress. And another one, I was on the uh, Air Force One with, uh, with President Obama uh, to discuss my position, which was to basically hold on for a public option. And the discussion that I had with him, it was very clear to me that he wouldn't be moved. There was nothing he would do uh, uh, to uh, secure my vote uh, uh, by extending uh, and putting a public option in the bill. He just wouldn't do it. So I had to make a decision. Did I want to see the entire bill go down when I had some of my constituents who were concerned about pre-existing conditions and putting their, their kids on? Uh, or, you know, was I, or, you know, was I going to be a purist and just say, it's not the way I want it, and so I'm going to just kill the bill because I was really in a pivotal position here. I was the last... Uh, person in, of a 75 member uh, congressional group who said that they would not vote for the bill unless it had a public option. So in the end, the president didn't want to didn't want to do that. And so I had to make a decision uh, based on what I thought was best for the country at that time, even though I'm for single payer, even though I, uh, I didn't like the bill, it did, wasn't what I wanted. And even though uh, it didn't have a public option, uh, you know, I did it as a measure of, of um, responding to the constituents who were asking me to vote for it. But let me tell you, uh, it still left the insurance companies in charge of health care. And, and it, it, it was an intermediate step. If we can prove, think about this, Jimmy, if we proved that we could do that kind of reform, we could take it that far, then we should be able to go uh, the next mile to a single payer plan. We showed reform was possible. And one of the concerns I had is if is if my vote helped to send this down, then we wouldn't be able to show that any kind of reform is possible. So, you know, it's one of those moments where you have to, have to you know, look at the re- reality of things and say, well, can I get everything? Can I get what I want? No. Uh, but can my constituents get some benefit? Yes. So I voted for the interest of my constituents, even though not exactly what I wanted. And so, and what is your feeling about why the Barack Obama didn't why could you not move him? Why was he against giving people something he promised them that he would? He promised he wouldn't sign a bill without a public option, and then he could have easily gotten it, and he didn't. So that's my question. Well, in the time that I spent with him, you know, we talked about a lot of things. Healthcare was one of was you know the thing that was most significant on the table. But what I saw is that uh, on this particular issue, he just wasn't flexible at all. He wasn't in any mood to negotiate. He basically 
said this is the way I'm going to do it, and I'm not going to make any changes. And and as a matter of fact, I mean, that could have jeopardized the whole bill. That could have actually uh, jeopardized his presidency. And, uh, you know, that was a concern I had as well. So, um, you know, I am. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay. I don't know. I don't know why, Jimmy. I don't know why. But I can tell you that I, I saw what I thought was uh, a certain amount of inflexibility that could have endangered his whole health care proposal. Please make sure you're subscribed. It only takes a second. Make sure you're subscribed and click that bell so they give you a notice whenever we drop a video. And if you can become a patron, we give you hours of bonus material every week. Our next live show is June 30th in Portland, Oregon. And we do a super solid chat every Saturday. That's our live stream. You can ask us questions and we answer back. That's Saturdays at 2 p.m. Pacific. Plus, we're on Steam It. We're steaming it right now. Mm-hmm.